everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Rania Rafiq Khalil. Uh, welcome to the BUE Research Center for Irish Studies. This is um, our seminar. Um, all right. Um, our guest speaker will be uh, Dr. Christina Morin, and our um, moderator, who has, um, you know, generously agreed um, to do this, is um, Dr. Maria Del Mar Gonzalez Chacon. She teaches literature and English language. Her main areas of research are contemporary Irish theatre with a special interest in the plays of Marina Carr and her rewriting of Greek myths, the translations and adaptations of Spanish plays by Irish playwrights with a focus on the theatre of Federico Garcia Lorca in Ireland and teaching innovation. Her latest publications are the concept of the edge in the plays of Marina Carr, uh, in 2020. Um, this is not about love, this is about guilt and terror in 2011. Um, and also in 2020, um, she has, and correct me Marie if this is not right, but um, speaking through another culture, Frank McGuinness's version of Federico Garcia Lorca's The House of Bernard, uh, Bernarda Alba. Yes. Okay, all right. This okay. Thank you. And new methodologies <laughs> for teaching ESL in higher and adult education, virtual campus, EXE learning, and blogs. Um, and this was in 2019. She has yes. presented her research in national and international conferences and has been a visiting research at Mill Research Institute, National University of Ireland, Galloway Institute of Irish Studies, Queen's University, Belfast, and Women's Studies Centre, University of York. She has been the Vice President of an Association of Young Researchers on Anglophone Studies and is a reviewer of Studios Irelandes, Irish Studies Review or Nordic Irish Studies. She's also the, sec the Secretary of um, Arch Archium Revista del Filologia. The Filologia, yes. <laughs> Welcome, it's the academic journal of our, our university. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Christina and Dr. Maria, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rania. So good afternoon uh, from the Principality of uh, Asturias in Spain. It is a pleasure for me to, to chair this uh, seminar hosted by the British University in Egypt, specifically by the Research Centre for uh, Irish Studies. I would like to express, first of all, my gratitude to Dr. Uh, Rania Khalil and to the Research Center for uh, Irish Studies for inviting me to, to participate in these sessions. And I uh, do agree with Professor uh, André Pilny, who delivered one of the seminars that I attended uh, two weeks ago and who stated the relevance of, of the creation of the Center for, for Irish Studies in these difficult times. And I do agree also with uh, Professor Pilney when, when he said that we all hope that this will uh, constitute uh, a forum for debate and, and an essential uh, network for senior and, and, and young uh, scholars in, in our field. Uh, the title of today's seminar is Irish Gothic Literature, an introduction, and it is uh, delivered by Dr. Tina uh, Morin, uh, who is head uh, of English at the University of Limerick, where she uh, has been lecturing since uh, 2012. She earned her PhD in English Literature at Trinity College uh, Dublin uh, in 2007 with a thesis focused on the novels of the Anglo-Irish uh, writer Charles Robert Maturin. Her research interest uh, centers on uh, Romantic area, uh, Irish Gothic literature, book history, and Irish women's writing, and she has a number of uh, well-regarded publications in, in this field. Uh, for instance, the Gothic novel in Ireland in 2018, Traveling Irishness in the Long 19th Century, 2017, Irish Gothic genres, forms, modes, and traditions, 2014, or Charles Robert Maturin and the Haunting of Irish Romantic Fiction. And her current research focuses on, on the dissemination and circulation uh, of Irish novels published in London by the uh, Minerva Press. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Tina uh, Morin. Uh, we're looking forward to, to listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to share it now. Okay. And uh, hopefully you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me get it in on a slideshow. Okay. 
So um, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, uh, special thanks to Rania for thinking of me for this inaugural series of um, BUE's exciting new Research Center of Irish Studies, um, which I think is a really great development. And um, as Maria mentioned, like Professor Pilney, like Andre, I, um, I'm really delighted to see this um, and it's in such short space of time as well, Rania was telling me that she only conceived of this idea at this time last year and to have it up and running and ready to go it just seems um, amazing to me. So well done to you, Rania. Um, and thank you, Maria, for that um, generous introduction. Um, it's a real privilege for me to have the opportunity to share with you today a bit of my own ongoing research and to speak about a topic that I really, really love even now so many years after I first started exploring it. And I hope that we'll have a bit of time afterwards for after my presentation for um, some chat and some questions um, and to think about some of the potential intersections between what you're researching and studying and, and what I'm talking about. And my apologies in advance if some of what I'm gonna say seems a little basic. I didn't want to assume any prior knowledge of Irish Gothic literature. So I've made this as inclusive as possible. Um, and of course, if there's anything that you want more specifics about, or if you want more details about, we can chat about that um, afterwards. I'm gonna skip the first two slides because Maria gave such a, such, a, such a great introduction and I don't need to go into any of that because it's already been covered. Um, those are my primary research interests and some of my recent um, publications. Just going to skip right into the meat of my presentation, which is the Irish Gothic. Um, and in my research, in all of my research, basically, I'm really interested in two seemingly simple but really fundamental questions. First, what is Gothic? And second, what is Irish Gothic? And if I were to pause right now, if I were to do a poll or, or you know, just quiz you, um, chances are most of you would say that you've heard of these terms before. Um, you'd be willing to hazard a brief definition of both of them, even if those definitions consisted just of a series of adjectives, you know, spooky, eerie, terrifying, dark, or um, a list of names, um, Poe, Stoker, Wild. Um, and this is an exercise I really like to do with my students, uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate. Um, and it's interesting because it highlights both the ubiquity of the term Gothic and its sheer indeterminateness, right? We all instinctively know what Gothic is, and yet it can mean lots of different things. And it can be applied to a whole host of social and cultural and literary phenomena with apparently little to connect them. Um, so in my research, one of my key concerns is thinking about definitions. Um, thinking about the ways in which we in the 20th and 21st centuries have described and classified Gothic literature and specifically Gothic literature of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and I'm interested in, in thinking about how our taxonomies fit with the period's own conceptualizations of its literary production. Um, and one of the really interesting things that happens when you start to kind of peel off these literary labels um, is that you begin to notice just how easily they fall apart. And I'm mixing my metaphors here, but um, you start to realize that they, they don't really apply as well as you, you kind of assumed. Um, you start to notice that the typical characteristics on which they're based begin to look not at all like the norm, but actually the exception. Um, and this isn't just an academic exercise. Instead, when we probe these labels, like the Gothic novel and the Irish Gothic, we realize that there's a real disparity between our conventional scholarly views of these literary forms um, and the literature that they're meant to describe. Um, it might surprise you, in fact, um, but 18th and 19th century writers generally didn't call or describe their works Gothic as Gothic. Um, that's a development that comes later in 20th and 21st century criticism where we try to classify and identify and, and in often very helpful ways. But what happens is then we get a, a kind of um, incomplete understanding of 
this literature. And that's why, for instance, or at least partially why, when we talk of the Irish Gothic, we think of the writers here on this slide. We think of Stoker, we think of Wilde, we think of Lefanu, we might potentially think of Matron, but generally speaking, we think of these writers. And maybe we'll think of Dracula or Uncle Silas, right? But we don't have a sense of a wider um, Gothic um, literary canon in Ireland in the 18th and 19th centuries, okay? Um, and what I'm interested in doing in my work, therefore, is to, to recover 18th and 19th century understandings of the term Gothic and how they under, how 18th and 19th century writers and readers understood the work that we would now classify as Gothic um, so that we can kind of recover the vast swathes of, of literature that have been excluded from our, our kind of canon of literature precisely because they don't seem to fit into these retroactively applied molds. Um, um, so so those are, that's my kind of main focus in my research. Um, and I think the, the importance of this kind of revisionary work becomes um, really clear when we, when we consider Irish Gothic literature. Again, as I say, you know, you're probably familiar with these writers here on um, the slide. Um, and, but the thing about Irish Gothic is our recognition of it comes from such a select um, group of authors and texts. As a form, Irish Gothic, um, as we generally understand it today, is identified almost exclusively with the fantasy novels of Victorian writers such as Sheridan Lefanu, Graham Stoker, and Oscar Wilde. Although the origins of Irish Gothic are often traced to Charles Robert Matron's Mammoth Wanderer, published in 1820. And this term Irish Gothic is widely used today still to describe Irish authored Gothic fiction with a kind of peculiar national trait. And that peculiar national trait is um, a kind of autobiographical exploration of the particular social and cultural conditions of 19th century Ireland. And in particular, Irish Gothic is read as exploring the mixed fears and desires um, of a minority Anglo-Irish population threatened imaginatively, if not actually, by the unsettled native Catholic population over whom they maintained precarious control. Now, I won't go into too much detail here about the Irish, about Irish history, but suffice it to say, right, by the late 19th century, Ireland had effectively been in, a, been in the position of a kind of English colony for many centuries. Um, the Act of Anglo-Irish Union passed in 1800 officially unified the two countries, but there had been an English ruling presence in Ireland long before that. And the members of this elite group most of them only nominally English by the Victorian period as descendants of English men and women who had relocated to Ireland um, generations before, they're often known as the Anglo-Irish ascendancy um, with that hyphenated term Anglo-Irish indicating their, di their, div sorry, their divided identities and loyalties. And it's this sense of division the fact of being a minority Protestant ruling class in Ireland with effective control over a majority Catholic population understood as hostile, as violent, as unruly, that's supposed to be at the heart of the Irish Gothic and except its explorations of otherness, of reverse colonization, of social decay, right? And again, as I said earlier, what I'm really interested in doing in my research is considering the ways in which this label, Irish Gothic, and its understandings of the literature that might be called Gothic in an Irish context, does injustice to the real breadth and variety of Gothic literary production in Ireland. Um, the tendency to confine Irish Gothic literature to the fantasy echo is especially troubling in this regard, because it suggests basically that Irish writers before Lefanu, before Stoker, before Wilde, simply didn't produce any literature that might be considered Gothic, with that kind of odd exception of Matron. Um, and this is despite the fact that so-called first wave Gothic literature began to 
appear in Britain in the latter half of the 18th century and basically dominated popular literary production in the 1790s. So it's as if we're saying, well, Irish writers didn't have anything to do with that. Um, but first, uh, before, and I'm going to get into that in a second, but first I want to give a kind of abbreviated history of this wider first wave Gothic literary production, just so we're all on the same page. Okay. Um, Gothic literature, this first wave Gothic literature is, is generally understood um, to begin with the publication in 1764 of Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto. Um, and when we talk of first wave Gothic literature, we're, we're generally thinking of the Gothic novel. Okay, again, another label that doesn't really do justice to the kind of cross formal nature of Gothic literary production. But anyway, we generally talk about the Gothic novel in this period. We generally understand first wave Gothic literature to be a subgenre of the novel that develops in the latter half of the 18th century. Um, and enjoys notable popular success um, in the 1790s in particular before basically exhausting itself in the first two or three decades of the 19th century. Um, and as I said, it's commonly understood to begin with Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, the second edition of which famously did contain the subtitle A Gothic Story. Um, and, and that's often why we argue that it's the first Gothic novel, because it actually refers to itself as Gothic. Though so <laughs> I'll come back to Walpole's um, motivations in a second. Um, and generally, when we talk about this first wave Gothic literature, we, we, we think of a set of characteristics, right? The Gothic novel as a label comes with a typical set of conventions, and those conventions are a medieval Catholic continental setting. Um, supernatural figures and events, explained or unexplained. Um, an evocation of the Burkean sublime, right? Burke had described the sublime in 1757 in his philosoph philosophical inquiry into the origins of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful as the highest emotion the mind is capable of feeling. And we see that often kind of evoked in Gothic literature of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Of course, there's an interest in um, creating and man maintaining suspense and often, and this is particularly true of what we sometimes call female Gothic literature um, associated with Radcliffe um, and as the name suggests, female authors thinking about female experiences. There's often a focus on an orphaned female protagonist who is beset by villainous men intent both on her financial and her physical assets, leading to frequent scenarios of abduction, assault, incest, rape, near rape. Um, and so there's, that's the kind of set of conventions we think of when we think of the Gothic novel, okay? Um, and you can see some of the main kind of names that we think of when we think of first wave Gothic, Horace Walpole, Clara Reeve, Charlotte Smith, Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis are the kind of um, figures who dominate um, Gothic literary production in the 1790s. Um, generally speaking, the development of Gothic literature in the, in the 18th century is um, kind of disrupted and discontinuous. After Walpole publishes The Castle of Otranto, there are only a few isolated publications that are now considered Gothic until the form really takes off in the 1790s, as I say, with Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis. And then the Gothic novel then enjoys a kind of short-lived heyday in that revolutionary period in the 1790s before um, beginning to kind of fall away in the first decades of the 19th century to the point that by the time Charles Robert Matron publishes Mammoth the Wanderer in 1820, he's understood to have come to the form too late. He's, he's missed the vogue. Um, so Man with the Wanderer is often read as this kind of belated masterpiece of the Gothic novel and a, a kind of anticipation of the Irish Gothic that would really only come into its own some 50 or 60 years later. Um, and this perception of Melmoth persists despite the fact that Mary Shelley's famous Gothic novel Frankenstein was only published two years before Man with the Wanderer. Um, but we have this idea that there's this identifiable kind of period of the of the um, Gothic novel. It stops, goes away for a while, and then it's revived at the end of the 19th century, particularly in Ireland, okay? 
And again, this our understandings here have a lot to do with labels and the ways in which labels kind of enforce delimited periods and delimited ideas. Um, and what happens then is, um, although we these labels are super useful in terms of, of thinking about the commonalities and, and thinking about the height of popularity of these um, you know, forms, what happens is we end up erasing lots of literature um, that would otherwise seem to kind of complement and contribute to the development of these forms. Um, and this is, I think, particularly the case with Irish Gothic literature. Um, so what happens when we start to think beyond Stoker, Wilde, and Lefanu when we think about Irish Gothic? Well, we start to realize that there actually were quite a lot of writers producing literature that might fall under um, the, the periods understanding of Gothic. Um, for instance, um, Thomas Leland's novel in 1762, Longsword, which is a kind of Gothic historical mix, has been identified as an earlier Irish Gothic novel than Horace Walpole's The Castle of Toronto. Elizabeth Griffith's fictions in the 1770s are important examples of Irish female Gothic in um, the late 18th century. Um, her novels, The History of Lady Barton, The Story of Lady Juliana Harley, etc. cetera. Um, and then there are other writers um, in the kind of 1780s and 1790s who in a sense rival the popularity of Radcliffe and yet are completely forgotten today. And in particular, Regina Maria Roach, um, her novels, The Children of the Abbey in 1796 and Claremont in 1798 were incredible bestsellers of the period and yet are not read today um, and are not remembered today. Um, despite the fact that The Children of the Abbey was one of the most reprinted novels of the 19th century, uh, sorry, of, of, of the period. Um, Mrs. F.C. Patrick and Anne Fuller are good examples of com almost completely unknown Irish writers today producing Gothic fiction in the period. Mariah Edgeworth's Castle Rackrent in 1800, better known today as a national tale or a regional novel, actually is playing specifically with ideas of contemporary Gothic fiction with its title, Castle Rackrent. Um, and then of course we know Charles Robert Matron's Mammoth the Wanderer in 1820. And there are, there are many different reasons why we seem to have forgotten these earlier Irish Gothic texts. Um, and, and I look at a lot of these reasons in my research, in particular in my um, monograph, The Gothic Novel in Ireland, circa 1760 to 1829. Um, but a lot of these reasons have to do with our current perceptions of Irish literature, um, particularly in relation to English literature, right? Um, the Gothic novels of a writer like Regina Maria Roach are seen to be simply unoriginal imitations of more masterful English writers like Anne Radcliffe. Um, and this kind of thinking affects Irish literature in the 18th and 19th centuries much more widely than just when it comes to Gothic literature, right? Um, and this is, an, this is an idea very familiar to, to scholars in Irish studies, but Irish writing is seen um, as what David Lloyd has famously called minor literature, um, always reliant on a major literature, in particular that of England, and never quite successfully distinguishing itself from it. Um, and the scholarly tendency to counter this prevalent understanding of the derivativeness of 19th century Irish literature has, in some senses, <laughs> I'm making a kind of controversial argument, but um, has in some senses done more harm than good when it comes to Irish Gothic literature. Um, for instance, so interested are we in the regional and national forms that developed in Ireland in the run-up to and in the Im immediate aftermath of the Act of Union in 1800, we forget that they emerge from and very often merge with the Gothic novel um, that was then so popular in Britain and Ireland, right? We think about the national tale and regional fiction suddenly developing in Ireland around about 1800 um, and, and kind of completely ignore the fact that the Gothic is still really popular at this period. Um, and Sydney Owenson's The Wild Irish Girl, published in 1806, 
the novel generally understood to establish the national tale in Ireland. Um, and uh, in doing so, or, or, and the national tale um, briefly is a, is a form that works to basically reconcile Ireland and England to a union that was very often imaged as a marriage in the periodical press of the, peri of the time. Um, but the Wild Irish Girl and the National Tale more widely owes quite a lot to contemporary Gothic literature, as does, as I've already suggested, Mariah Edgeworth's earlier novel, Castle Rackrent. Um, and, and as I said earlier, right, Edgeworth's title for her novel there specifically invokes the Gothic literary tradition so popular when Edgeworth was writing her tale in the 1790s. Um, and yet, we tend to think about these novels, these forms being so different from Gothic, um, but they're fundamentally influenced by drawing on and, and impacting Gothic literary, literary production as well. And another related issue, um, as I suggested earlier, is, is the, the limitation imposed by artificial labels, such as Irish Gothic and the Gothic novel. Um, and again, as I suggested earlier, right, these terms are valuable for the work that they represent. Um, the identification and scholarly recuperation of two interrelated bodies of popular fiction often overshadowed in contemporary critical responses and more recent analysis alike by literature considered more reputable and more elite, right? Gothic in the late 18th and early 19th centuries as, as a popular literary form is condemned by critics for basically um, doming down the course of English literature. And it's developing in a period when um, basically the print sphere has suddenly become democratized and reading has become available to a much wider group of individuals than it had been previously. Um, and so there are real concerns amongst the critical establishment about what this will do to English literature as a whole. Um, and so we see in the contemporary periodical press a real interest in trying to police literature and to establish um, categories of good versus bad literature. And Gothic literature, or as it was often referred to in the period, terror literature or terrorist literature, Germanic literature, generally always follow, falls into the bad category, <laughs> into the low category as popular fiction. Um, and it's interesting, right, because um, our critical analysis today sometimes still falls into those same categorization tendencies, right? Um, and we, we forget that really what's super interesting is that we're ignoring all of the works that were read by everybody else, everybody who wasn't critics, you know? Um, and I often tell my students, right, the novels that we're talking about here, even though we don't remember them today, they were essentially the Harry Potters of their day. Everybody wanted them. Everybody wanted to read them. Everyone was dying to get their hands on them, even if they didn't want to admit that that's what they wanted to read. They were, they were reading it. Regina Maria Roach's The Children of the Abbey in the early 19th century, or, or sorry, the mid 19th century um, was still on sale in the US and was being kind of lauded as this novel that was once in the hands of every reader in America and Britain. Um, so these novels have this incredible reach um, and, and yet they're condemned by critics. Um, uh, so yeah, <laughs> I got off on a tangent there, but my point is, right, so these literary labels do kind of injustice to the literature and seem to kind of follow in the same paths of the criticism of the day, right? Um, and, but we, you know, we have to remember, right, that these labels, the Gothic novel and the Irish Gothic, they are, they are products of contemporary, uh, sorry, products of modern criticism. Um, and the inverted commas that I constantly kind of put them in, um, and that seem to so naturally envelop them, suggest their retrospective or retroactive nature. Um, and underline their failure really to offer a faithful reflection of 18th and 19th century understandings of the literature that they're meant to describe. And they also, these labels also draw attention to the unfortunate, if, if largely unintended, homogenizing effect produced by artificial categorizations that have successfully consigned to oblivion whole swathes of apparently outlying literary production. 
Um, and this process of exclusion creates in consequence these kind of established literary canons and, and indeed Gothic literary canons that now need to be interrogated to account for the texts that have fallen victim to what Franco Moretti has so aptly termed the slaughterhouse of literature. Um, so my, um, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, um, I have a slide here and it seems to be out of order, but anyway. <laughs> um, so my, my research um, is, is, my research pushes against the normative limited limits of these categories, the Irish Gothic and the Gothic novel to kind of engage in what Anne Williams has called, quote, a thoughtful analysis of Gothic that challenges the kind of literary history that organizes, delineates and defines. And to do so, my research proposes basically that we need to widen and broaden the, the boundaries of Irish Gothic literature within the remit of both Irish and Gothic studies. Um, and so, I'm, and I take my cue here from Moretti um, and Moretti's call, quote, to make the literary field longer, larger and deeper, end quote. So my research aims to establish um, much wider, much deeper, much broader conceptualizations of the Irish literary Gothic that go well beyond the com comparatively few texts that now constitute our study of Irish writing and Gothic literature alike. And this is kind of um, inspired by Moretti's idea of distant reading, um, but I kind of combine distant reading and close, and, and close reading. Um, and how this aim of kind of establishing this, this broader, deeper, wider, um, understanding of Irish Gothic, how that's best accomplished is first and foremost by a recovery of 18th and 19th century understandings of the very term Gothic and the literature associated with it. Because I can't stress enough here, um, in the 18th and 19th century, Gothic was not a codified generic label. It was not a kind of byword for this group of literature, this, this body of literature as it now is today. Um, instead, Gothic, generally with a capital G, referred to the past as, um, as well as the kind of chronological and social evolution that had produced present day Britain. Um, and to speak of the Gothic past was to conjure two apparently contradictory but no less linked ideas of, on the one hand, and this is on the, the side as, as Watt calls it, a distant non-specific period of ignorance and superstition from which an increasingly civilized nation had triumphantly emerged. And on the other, an august political inheritance derived from a vaguely, very vaguely conceptualized set of Germanic and Teutonic tribes, including the Anglo-Saxons who had who were seen to have given birth to modern British liberty, despite their inborn bar barbarity. Um, and the latter usage in particular functioned as a method of critiquing current governmental policies and political trends um, with what William Molyneux termed the noble Gothic constitution coming to be understood as this far removed, and these are Molyneux's terms, font fount of constitutional purity and political virtue from which the nation had become dangerously alienated. Um, and, and so basically Gothic in the late 18th and early 19th centuries is really a way of thinking about the past and its relationship to the present. Um, and it's that kind of basic understanding of the term that we, we need to have, I think, when we think when we when we try to recover what Gothic really meant in this period and what it means to call literature of this period Gothic. Um, because it's with this idea, the idea of Gothic as um, describing the past and its relation to the relationship to the present, it's that sense of the term that Walpole has in mind when he appends the subtitle A Gothic Story to the second edition of Otranto. And Otranto is an interesting case because um, when it was first published in its first edition, it was published anonymously and presented as a found manuscript, okay? Um, and critics loved it. They thought this was fantastic. They thought it was basically a kind of historical artifact. 
that they that readers could use to learn about the past. But in the second edition, Walpole revealed his authorship and also said basically this was all a ruse. So critics had a very different response to the second edition, partially one suspects because they were embarrassed to have been taken in, but also because they were, they were concerned about what it meant that Walpole, this enlightened 18th century British writer, could produce this kind of writing in the modern day, right? Um, and it, we have to remember that Walpole, um, so in the historiography of the Gothic novel, Walpole's decision to use this subtitle, A Gothic Story, um, although it's been hailed as this inaugural moment of the genre, was really actually a kind of tongue in cheek moment where Walpole was basically poking fun at his critics and, and, and laughing at them for having believed his ruse in the first place. Um, so his use of the subtitle wasn't purposeful literary innovation, nor was it taken as such by his contemporaries, who, as I noted earlier, very, very rarely followed, in his, in his, um, followed his example in naming their texts. Instead, this subtitle acted as what Emma Cleary calls, quote, a flippant paradox, chiefly intended to annoy stuffy critics. After all, how could a gothic story, a story of the past, you know, a story about the past, how could it have a modern author? Um, so as Cleary's comments indicate, the, the pronounced negative critical response to Otranto in its second edition and its revelation that Walpole had, you know, tricked the public, revolved around 18th century conceptions of the past and its temporal and ideological relationship with the present. What caused concern was Walpole's perceived attempt to revive a savage past and its practices in an enlightened age. So there was concern over the, the kind of collapsing of the difference between this Gothic past and the present day. Um, as the Monthly Review declared in its review of the second edition, quote, it is indeed more than strange that an author of a refined and polished genius should be an advocate for reestablishing the barbarous superstitions of Gothic devilism. And Gothic here is meant to mean the past of, of archaic, of savage devilism, okay? So remembering how an 18th and early 19th century audience would have understood the term Gothic as referring to a particular relationship between the past and the present helps us to think about how we might begin to reintegrate Irish authors into the historiography of Romantic era Gothic literature. And I do this in my 2018 book um, in particular by considering some of the expectations that we have for the quote unquote Gothic novel, namely, medieval Catholic continental settings. Um, because as traditionally understood, the Gothic novel deploys these archaic settings as a manner of contrasting modern, enlightened, Protestant England with the pre-modern, irrational, and Catholic continent. Um, and this is especially important work in the revolutionary period in, um, at the close of the 18th century, when England is feeling really threatened um, threatened on all sides by revolutionary activity, right? There's the American Revolution in the 1770s into the 1780s, um, or, or the American War of Independence. Um, then 1789 to 1815 is dominated by the revolutionary and Napoleonic period in France, with the French Revolution and the fall of the Bastille in 1789 kind of coinciding with this um, uptick in the production of Gothic literature in Britain. Um, in 1793, of course, um, Louis says is executed and England joins the alliance against France. And from 1793 to 94, we have the reign of terror under Robespierre. Um, 1804, Napoleon's cr uh, crowned emperor um, and then only defeated in 1815. Um, meanwhile, elsewhere, there's the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. In Ireland, there's the 1798 Rebellion and followed in quick um, succession by Robert em Emmett's Rebellion in 1803. Elsewhere in Europe, there are a number of different revolutions taking place. So 
it is a very unsettled period in, in global politics, right? And England is feeling particularly threatened by these revolutionary activities very close to home. Um, and we can see some of the fear and anxiety caused, particularly by French revolutionary activity, um, in some of the caricatures that we get in the period, such as James Gilray's 1793 print, A New Map of England and France, The French Invasion, um, in which, as you can see on the slide, an anthropomorphized England expresses its utter disdain for France by defecating on the latter country and its supply ships in the channel. Um, and obviously, it's an attempt to deal humorously and defiantly with the threat from France. But it underlines English anxieties, which then bleed into contemporary literary production, such as the Gothic, um, where the medieval Catholic continental settings become almost allegorical. Um, and, and by kind of um, a way of contrasting the rational British Protestant reader and this irrational activity elsewhere. Um, but it's interesting to note that our concentration on these medieval Catholic continental settings as the norm of Gothic literature of this period means that we overlook texts that don't have those settings um, and at the same time can forget the local English settings of Gothic novels such as Reeves, The Old English Baron published in 1777 and Sophia Lee's Recess in 1783 to 1785. Now this isn't to deny the importance of distant and distancing geography in the literary Gothic, but instead to argue again for a reconsideration of the local um, in our understanding of Gothic literature of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, what's needed, I think, is an expansion of Emma Cleary's observation that Quote, while Radcliffe may have favored Southern Europe, her followers generally set, her, that set their novels in Britain, which of course is something we tend to forget when we think about these Catholic continental settings. And Cleary's supposition is that the literary Gothic from the 1790s experienced a steady movement from the geographical otherness of exotic locations to the uncanny familiarity of home just as it gradually transitioned from the from distant temporal periods to more recent, even contemporary times. Um, and although persuasive in their insistence on the renegotiation of both temporal and geographical Gothic landscapes, Cleary's arguments fail to account for the decisively British settings of texts such as Radcliffe's The Castles of Athlin and Dunbane, published in 1789 and set, as the title suggests, in Scotland. Um, and indeed the Old English Baron, which I mentioned earlier. And this latter text, The Old English Baron, is, um, it's worth remembering, is one of the few novels that actually did call itself Gothic, um, a term that it applied specifically to the times and manners of 15th century Yorkshire, which is interesting because thinking about um, English barbarity uh, rather than Catholic continental barbarity. Um, and the interest in indigenous scenery, not to mention characters and events, evidenced in these and a multitude of other works in this period forcefully indicates that landscape in the literary Gothic um, is not simply a question or, 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 or location is not simply a question of displacement. Rather, much as with the names and titles that authors gave to their works, the setting of a given piece of fiction can represent a very particular choice one with both narratological and ideological import. Um, and I think to ignore the significance of this preference is um, fundamentally to misconstrue the literary Gothic. And, and indeed, it's something that we do all the time when we think of those conventions for the Gothic novel, when we expect there to be a Catholic continental setting. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in my work is using quantitative analysis as a way of finding new um, insights into this literature um, and allowing us to really strikingly visualize um, some of the characteristics of this fiction. In particular, here you can see the geographical settings. Um, this graph shows um, a, selection of the a selection of 90 of the 114 texts that I considered in the Gothic novel in Ireland circa 1760 to 1829. Um, 
so 114 Irish Gothic works. Um, and we can see that the vast majority of these works locate their narratives primarily in the British Isles, which for our purposes means um, mainland England, as well as Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. And a much smaller percentage of works feature those Catholic continental settings that we've come to expect from first wave Gothic fiction. Um, and two of those 90 works reject both Britain and Europe altogether for much more exotic locations in um, the Holy Land and Scandinavia. Um, and this is significant because these Irish works are precisely those that would have been read at the time as falling under the rubric of Gothic, okay, even if they didn't specifically call themselves um, such. And here it's worth thinking about exactly how Irish and British writers of this period of this period marketed their works as what we would now understand as Gothic without actually using their term, that term. And Robert Miles has very convincingly argued that late 18th and early 19th century authors deployed certain marketing cues to position their texts as examples of what was then, as I said earlier, variously known as terror terrorist, horror, German, or Germanic literature. Um, some of these features, as Miles outlines, some of these marketing cues, as Miles outlines, include, and I'm quoting here, geographical features, the recess, ruins, the rock, Alps, Black Valley, Black Tower, haunted cavern, architectural features, priory, castle, abbey, convent, nunnery, ancient house, cloister, um, ghosts and its cognates, so apparition, specter, phantom, etc., exotic names, Manfredi, Edward de Courcy, Wolfenbach, generic or historical figures, the monk, the genius, um, Lady Jane Grey. These are all ways that authors could um, signal to readers that they could expect a novel of terror and a terrorist novel in these pages. So that's why right, Castle Rackrent is such an interesting case because Edgeworth was playing with her readers' expectations. They would expect when they picked up a novel like Castle Rackrent to get a Gothic novel. Um, and, and Edgeworth then continues to play with those expectations in that novel. Um, and some of the marketing cues, like right, those, the Irish texts that I consider in the Gothic novel in Ireland from 1760 to 1829, they, um, how they use these marketing cues, you can see that most of them use those generic or historical figures, um, the monk, the genius, the minstrel, um, but they also kind of use those other um, marketing cues that Miles locates. And so basically this is how, what I'm interested in doing in my research um, in breaking down our restrictive understandings of Irish and Gothic literature um, uh, and looking at different ways in which these labels that we now use have, have kind of um, limited our understanding of this literature. So I try to break down those different boundaries. Some of the boundaries, so for instance, I've looked here at, at geography, I've looked at um, marketing or, or names. Um, I also look at, for instance, the relationship between historical and Gothic fiction, um, because again, that's a distinction in the early 19th century that tends to um, lead us to overlook Gothic literary production because we're interested in the historical novel that um, Sir Walter Scott, that is associated with Sir Walter Scott and the production of Waverley in 1814. Um, and again, which many early 19th century Irish authors are seen to unsuccessfully imitate in the early 19th century. Um, and it, the historical novel is generally understood as different in kind from the Gothic novel, but again, like the national tale and the re and regional fiction, the two are fundamentally intertwined. Um, and yeah, so I'm um, I'm really interested in in kind of recovering the Irish works that have been excluded because of these limitations. And I suppose I just draw up to close by saying that, right, in my work, <laughs> it would be it would be impossible to be exhaustive or definitive, right? And I, I don't intend to be, and I don't want to be. Um, and it would also be possible to become completely overwhelmed, right? Um, 
right now, as Claire Connolly has perceptively observed, um, quote, our current sense of the quantity of Irish fiction has rather outstripped our interpretive procedures, <laughs> meaning that critical challenges outweigh bibliographical ones at present. Um, so in research like mine, it would be really easy, as Connolly has rightly noted, to become, quote, lost in the sublime of literary history and paralyzed by dreams of total literary history. Um, and while my research brings back to view a large quantity of Irish writing currently overlooked by literary criticism, its focus is on interpreting um, rather than producing conclusive bibliographic quantifications of it. Um, and so in this, it adopts the kind of, uh, it adopts the belief that detailed close readings of individual texts can productively lead back to the kind of distant reading um, encouraged by Moretti. Um, at the same time, we fully acknowledge just how much work remains to be done to fully recover Irish Gothic literary production, particularly of the Romantic period. Um, and it's one of my hopes that my research will inspire further research and inspire further conversation um, and really, um, you know, encourage readers, uh, encourage readers to um, think more about Irish Gothic literature. Um, one of my key aims really is to <clears throat> prompt readers, particularly in the Gothic novel in Ireland, 1760 to 1829, is, is really to prompt readers to, um, to really think about just how rich Irish literary production of this period is, of the Romantic period is, um, while they continue in Moretti's terms, quote, to widen um, the domain of the literary historian and enrich its internal problematic by, specifically by, further consideration of Irish Gothic literature and its cross-formal and cross-generic nature. Um, and if this has piqued your interest at all, I'd, I'd really be delighted to chat further about it. Um, and otherwise, I'd be happy to take questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. So to, to recap the, the maybe the, the main ideas first, and then we can uh, pose some questions. Thank you very much, Christina. This was um, amazing for me. It was very, very interesting. Uh, so uh, let me just say that uh, uh, Tina uh, uh, explained the, 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 the meaning of, uh, of Gothic and how the, the, the term um, has that a uh, much wider uh, meaning than, than, than we might uh, expect. Um, how the, the term was created actually after the, the, the movement. Um, and, and she did the same as regards the, the, the canon of, of, of writers. Uh, she made this reference to Irish history, which I think is essential when we, when we are talking about uh, Irish literature, Irish history, uh, Ireland as a colony, the, the concept of Anglo-Irish, this sense of, of, of division uh, at the heart of, at the heart, sorry, of, of the uh, Irish um, Gothic. She provided this overview of the Gothic origins with the list of, of writers from Walpole, uh, Clara Reeve, Charlotte Smith, finishing with Charles Maturin. Uh, very interesting for me, the, the, the reference to the uh, Irish uh, female writers in this, in this part, and I would like to ask something about that later. Uh, very interesting also the compilation that, that she provided about Irish Gothic novels. Um, uh, are very interesting with, with the reference again to, to women's writers, which are not remembered today, as she explained, which have been maybe excluded. Um, I do agree with, with uh, Tina in the sense that the Irish Gothic literature continues being seen as a subject um, of uh, English Gothic literature. And in fact, this happens, for instance, uh, in my university. I will comment on that uh, later too. Um, she was uh, able to provide this amazing new perspective for me, okay, a new perspective on, on this uh, literature. It is definitely uh, necessary to revise Irish Gothic literature and to include it within the, the canon of, of uh, Gothic literature. Uh, very interesting, the data that you provided about the importance of setting, uh, uh, the, the, the data that you offered in the, in the graphs. Um, and to conclude, I think that what uh, Christina has done, as she herself uh, highlighted, was to try to, to 
uh, highlight the importance of the uh, new ways of using labels to avoid limitations, uh, recovering uh, Irish works that were excluded, um, to recover this uh, Irish Gothic literature. Um, you definitely have encouraged me to, to think more about uh, Irish Gothic literature. And I do have some questions for you, but maybe um, the other uh, attendants would like to, to go first, because I see that we have uh, Aida, uh, who has joined the seminar, and Francis, maybe if they want to ask something, or maybe you can also use the chat box, okay? Or Rania, you yourself, as you, as you want. Uh, it's okay, you can go ahead with your questions. Yes. Go ahead okay. with your questions and I'll, I'll join later. All right, uh, so Tina, my first question uh, is related to uh, the, uh, your, your reference to women's, women's writers, okay? I would like to, to ask you, what was the, the role of these women writers in, in, in Irish Gothic literature? What was the, their, their status? How was their status as, as writers in that society uh, of the time? Mm. It's interesting, I mean, I... I think I could say, right, that the majority of Irish writer uh, of Irish writers in this period producing Gothic literature are, are women. Um, and um, they are not well regarded. Um, it's still a period in which it's very difficult to make a living as a writer. Um, to be a professional female writer is a new phenomenon and is critically condemned really um, for the most part, especially when you're um, thinking about um, popular literature. Um, and you see a lot of these writers are um, trying to make a living from their writing. They're not earning that much um, despite, you know, so for instance, somebody like Regina Maria Roach, who reaches a huge audience, um, is never able to support herself that successfully with her writing. Um, and we know this because many of these writers write to the Royal Literary Society um, seeking financial assistance. Um, and um, so a lot of these women, whether they stay in Ireland or they emigrate to um, England, they are, um, they're dependent on their writing, but they're not really able to support themselves. Um, and um, they're, part of that is because to be a popular writer in this period is, is, is to be critically condemned, right? Um, to be seen to be a, a kind of hack writer um, producing um, ephemera for uh, a debased literary audience, a, a literary audience that um, is, is limited primarily to, or at least as critics understand it, limited primarily to um, circulating libraries and, and the kind of unthinking demands of circulating library uh, readers. Um, so yeah, so their position is very um, precarious. Um, and um, oftentimes, a lot of them, a lot of them publish with the Minerva Press, which is um, the period's kind of biggest publisher of, of popular fiction and, and um, a publisher that becomes essentially synonymous with um, Gothic romance in the period. And its proprietor, William Lane, um, is, is a real businessman, and he um, kind of enables or, or supports and encourages the expansion of the circulating library system across Britain. Um, and he forms partnerships with printers and booksellers elsewhere to really help ensure that the novels that he's publishing are reaching this global audience. And yet his writers aren't really seeing much financial return for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the they are almost, I can't think of, of one off the top of my head, one Irish female writer that I, I work on who was financially successful. <laughs> okay, and what about their situation nowadays? I mean, is, is there or are their works uh, recognized or acknowledged nowadays? Generally, are... no, generally no. Um, like uh, if you look at Regina Maria Roach's The Castle, uh, sorry, um, The Children of the Abbey in 1796, which as I said, um, you know, essentially rivaled in popularity any of Anne Radcliffe's novels. Um, there, it is very difficult to get your hands on a modern teaching edition of that novel. Um, whereas you can get any number of teaching editions, Oxford University Press editions of, of Radcliffe's novels 
even her lesser known ones. Um, so yeah, um, I, and I think part of that is because Roach and other Irish female writers who are producing popular Gothic fictions, particularly in the 1790s, they're seen just to be Radcliffe imitators. Oh. Um, and though their novels are reviewed in the periodic press of the time, oftentimes they are held up against Radcliffe. So again, that's one of those instances where our modern scholarship kind of replicates the contemporary assessments. So. All right, okay. Any other questions or, or comments? Yes, a yes, um, question from one of our guests, but, um, but Professor Aida, you can go ahead. To like yes, uh, yeah. okay. Um, I was particularly interested in the uh, quantitative analysis. <clears throat> it sort of made the, um, the features much clearer. Uh, that was a very interesting point. Um, I noticed, I joined late, but um, I noticed there's a picture of Oscar Wilde. Were you um, referring to the picture of Dorian Gray by any chance? I, I didn't talk about it in, in detail at all. Um, just that um, the picture of Dorian Gray is one of those texts yes. that's, you know, often kind of listed as the, as the Irish Gothic. Mm. I see, I see. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Would you, oh, sorry, would you consider Harry Potter, uh, the novels of uh, Rowland, um, sort of uh, Gothic novels, Gothic, uh, modern Gothic novels? Yeah, it's Following the trend? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, and, and this is the kind of ubiquity of Gothic because um, it, it's often argued that what happens um, at the start of the... Um, at the end of the 19th and into the early decades of the 20th century is that Gothic starts to splinter and it yes. starts to splinter into say science fiction. Although of course, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is often understood as the first science fiction novel as well. Um, but Gothic is seen to kind of almost disintegrate in, and, and kind of splinter off into these other forms, um, fantasy, science fiction. Um, and um, partially for that reason, then Gothic is everywhere, right? Yes. <laughs> so, I, agree. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think um, that, and, and some scholars would argue, well, you know, what's the point in, what's the, Gothic has lost all meaning in that sense. But, um, mm. I mean, I think you could certainly argue that um, the Harry Potter novels um, draw on Gothic traditions um, and, and yes. draw on Gothic conventions. Um, but I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it first and foremost, wouldn't describe the series first and foremost as Gothic. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Aida. And, and we have another question in the chat box for you, Tina. Okay, sure. Uh, okay. It is from Dr. Frances Carter, and she says, can Tina say why Gothic writers are unknown contemporaneously? Um, if they're unknown in, in the Romantic period or no? Now, I suppose, because she says yes. contemporaneously. Okay. Well, I mean, I think it's it's this kind of combination of factors. Um, uh, one of them being these labels that we that we we rely upon. And and again, I don't want to um, I don't want to kind of diss earlier Gothic studies scholarship because, of course, it's been so important to establishing, you know, the um, like, you know, the very usefulness of, of considering Gothic literature, um, which is sometimes still considered this kind of sub-literary genre, um, right, again, replicating the 18th and 19th century criticism of, of the form. Um, so early 20th and, in, and 21st century scholarship of Gothic, you know, literature has been super important in, in establishing the, the kind of value of researching Gothic literature and Irish Gothic literature, and we have a lot to owe to it. But um, I think that the labels have sometimes done us a disservice in the sense that they have been too narrow. Um, and I think partially for this reason, um, a lot of the Irish writers that we, we that I talked about today are, are simply forgotten because they don't seem to fall under those labels. And then of course, there's also then, as I said in my presentation, um, 
that tendency to measure Irish literature against English literature, um, and also um, our tendency, particularly in the Romantic period, to think of other, first and foremost, of other literary forms as defining the period, in particular the national tale and regional fiction in the early 19th century. Um, so, it, you know, I think it is a combination of different factors. Yeah. Those would be the, the principal ones. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Francis says, uh, Gothic seems mainstream now. And she also says, thank you, great answer, Bettina. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it is funny. And, and I think that the, the reason that we can, you know, have a seminar like this now is, is because of the work that has been done. Um, and again, I just want to repeat that. I have a lot of respect for the work that's come before me. Um, and I stand on, on the shoulders of, of those scholars. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that you only have to look over to England, for instance, where there's like the Ma Manchester Gothic Studies Center and um, Gothic has become quite my mainstream. And, um, you know, this idea of, of elite versus low or high versus low, elite versus popular literature, those distinctions have started to, to kind yeah. of become less meaningful or less important, I think in the 20th and, or in the 21st century in particular. Um, and I think for that reason, you know, there has been more kind of value accorded to um, Gothic and popular fiction more widely. Um, so for instance, you can go and study, a, a, go get a master's in popular literature in Trinity now, which is fantastic. All right, yeah. You know? um, and, and, and I think that's great, but um, I do think that even still, we we kind of unconsciously replicate 18th and 19th century kind of distinctions of, of high and low literature. And, and, and we really have to fight against that because it's it's the kind of, it's almost the norm. It's the norm to think of Gothic as this kind of ephemeral, like, you know, pulp kind of fiction that's not really worth too much consideration, that doesn't have a literary value. Um, but, you know, it, has, it does have a literary value and it does have um, a, a cultural value as well. It tells us, I mean, it's it, it's something to think about what everybody was reading. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It tells us a lot about the culture. Well, the society, yes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And Tina, you have also mentioned uh, the, 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 the influence of the... Uh, the, the English influence who, which has interfered with, with Irish Gothic literature. You, you were talking about the past or it, it still happens nowadays? Do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it was in the Romantic period in particular, or right. I, I mean, I suppose I think um, in, have I frozen? No, you haven't. Okay. <laughs> Um, certainly I was a little bit worried. No, so I think um, I think it, it's something we're definitely getting away from and we're moving away from it. But I mean, uh, the tendency, I think even, you know, oftentimes I ask my students, um, who is Bram Stoker? And, and they'll say he's an English writer. So it, I, I do think there is a tendency still yeah. to um, measure Irish writing with reference to English writing, to English writing um, yeah. and, and indeed to to kind of colonize Irish writers yes. as they could yes. um, when they've been successful, um, and, and that's not that's not a kind of um, I don't think that's the norm anymore. But I do think it's something that we in in Irish studies we still have to kind of. Um, for instance, in, at my university, we have this degree in English studies and we have this uh, small part devoted to Irish literature yeah. and the, 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 the part devoted to Irish literature is, is very, very much influenced by the uh, English mm -hmm. literature still. Yeah. Okay. And it's very difficult for students to, to understand what is a, an Irish literary work and what is the difference, yeah. even the, 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 the importance of Irish history. Yeah. It is mm, it's still uh, not uh, that well taught, in my opinion, mm -hmm. yeah. or deeply taught, in my opinion, at the, at the university here, for instance, okay, right. opposed to English history, which is uh, yeah. essential to make the distinction. So I think there is a lot of work there to do, mm. at least abroad, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Rania, please. <laughs> I've been very polite. I've had my hand up. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, um, okay, well, we'll do the thank yous in a bit, but I just want to ask now, um, Christina, you were talking about, um, I, you know, if, if someone is preparing like an MA program, all right, and they want to include Irish studies or Irish um, Gothic literature, where would they begin? I mean, I think your presentation is, is you know, your research seminar um, actually paves the way and is a wonderful place to start. Thanks. But what would be like, this is a starting point. I mean, yes, I mean, your presentation is definitely something that would be considered, but what advice would you give? So that's number one. And number two, um, because your research seminar will be shared publicly on the YouTube channel and the Facebook page and the website, for students all over the world. Those interested in Irish studies and particularly in Gothic Irish literature, what are the new areas of research? You know, you, you're, you're up to date with your research. So from that point, what are the new areas of research that um, early career researchers can explore? So in a sense, like your advice for them or your guidance. Yeah. And the last thing is, um, before you end your um, presentation, can you share the slide where you have all your works so that? Oh sure. You yeah. take a, I know I know Mar Maria did a wonderful job of you know listing all your publications, but um, yes, you know, I, I think I missed some of them. Well, this is this is this is not a definitive list, but <laughs> all right. Um, uh, oh, sorry. This is just. Um, my my books and edited books so okay oh and a special issue of romantic textualities which is yes. online yeah i missed that one that one just came out um last, last in the autumn so all right so, yeah um okay so the first question in terms of of what to put on a you know an irish studies course if you want to integrate irish gothic um in some senses, um, it's difficult to advise because one of the issues with um, late 18th and early 19th century Irish Gothic is availability and accessibility. Um, and if your university has access to 18th century collections online and your students aren't adverse to reading material um, virtually, and I suppose this is something we've all had to become much more familiar with today, but if they're not averse to reading something in 18th century collections online, it's an absolutely invaluable resource to have. But what I tend to do, rather than try to get students to read the whole of the Children of the Abbey in 18th century collections online, what I try to do is integrate short fiction and um, drama, as well as um, novel length fictions. Um, and the purpose is, is, well, I mean, the first purpose is to try to find accessible texts, right? Until we have a bigger body of readily available um, teaching editions of Irish Gothic, we have to kind of make do with what we have. And, um, and also um, integrating shorter fictions and dramas allows us to think about the multi-formal nature of Gothic literary production. So again, thinking beyond the quote unquote Gothic novel, um, and thinking about how Gothic was really a kind of cultural phenomenon that wasn't just confined to the novel. So for instance, I'll often include the short stories, short stories by Elizabeth Griffith um, from her, um, uh, she published a collection called um, Novelettes for, um, I can't remember the full name of it now, but um, I, I do a few of her short stories. Um, and then I'll also, put um, Matron's 1816 play, Bertram. Um, so I would suggest trying to work with some shorter fictions and dramas from the earlier period. Um, um, and then, I mean, I think you can't get away from Dracula and um, Lefanu, uh, Carmilla or Uncle Silas, because they're hugely important texts. It's not to dismiss how important they are to Gothic literature and Irish Gothic literature. Um, but I, I'm really, I'm really interested in thinking about um, 
where they come from, right? Because a lot of times when we think about Irish Gothic and when we combine our understanding to our, of Irish Gothic to this fantasy echo period, it's like these writers came up with Gothic all by themselves. And of course they didn't, you know? Um, they had so many other examples that they're, that they're drawing from, right? Um, and my other suggestion would be to um, think about some of the other texts, maybe not usually thought of, um, uh, from the mid 19th century. Um, some of the short stories, for instance, by Gerald Griffin, um, who again, again, this is a way of um, integrating or thinking about the multi-formal nature of Gothic, but also integrating Catholic writers, um, which again, pushes against that understanding of Gothic as a fun, as Irish Gothic is fundamentally Protestant in nature. In fact, it's not, it's a, it's a kind of cross-sectional, um, cross-sectarian um, literary, and cultural phenomena in the period. So that would be my recommendation there. Um, and certainly if somebody was interested in setting up a course and they wanted to talk about it, uh, I would be very, ha very, very happy to do that. <laughs> um, the second question, yeah. Before we move on to the second Anya? question. Yeah, uh, now in, when you're, and I'm, I'm thinking this like in the, in the lecture hall now, yeah. if you're teaching the, those short um, stories and the dramas, and you said something that was really important. It's like it's cross-sectional, and it's not just Catholic, and it, and it and it's not Protestant. So, would I be teaching the context? You know, social background. Yeah. Of course, with, with yeah. other texts, um, okay. yeah, with, with relevance to the text, just to and and keep in mind, my audience is different from from yours. They're not Irish, yeah. so they, yeah. they they do nothing. So I would have to provide the context. Um, yeah. For, for each text. I think so. And I, I mean, even, even for Irish students, I, I, I find that, um, you know, they're, they're not that familiar with the, the kind of historical context of the period. Um, and even if they have, you know, studied it in the past, it's worth thinking about the real relevance to um, literary production, thinking about as well, um, wider literary developments like you know it, it is I think foreign for students to to think about the literary sphere right this printing public um the reading nation as William St. Clair calls it as as suddenly being different in this period because they've had access to books all their lives you know um most of my students wouldn't question access to books and yet that's not the case in the late 18th and early 19th century. And there are fundamental changes um, to how printing is done and how printing is produced that suddenly make it available to so many more people. And if you don't understand that context, um, you, you don't understand why Gothic really takes off in the way that it does and popular literature takes off in the way that it does. So yeah, you absolutely have to bring in those historical and cultural contexts. And, and, and I would like to add here that apart from what you have mentioned, we, we as, uh, as uh, Spanish people, for instance, we, we, we find students who have not studied Irish history, only English history. Yeah. So the <laughs> historical background is essential. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the second question about if there are, are students who are interested in, in researching this area in particular, um, I mean, I think that it, it's kind of like what I, what I finished with. I think that right now we have a kind of growing bibliography of texts that um, are, are kind of now, can, now we're thinking of as actually Irish Gothic, but the but the issue is we don't have a lot of analysis of those texts. Um, so I, I would suggest starting there, you know, looking at some of the texts that um, seem to, or, or that, that now fall into our wider idea of Irish Gothic and, and analyzing them um, and actually producing, you know, careful close readings of them. Um, and also um, for, for any, kind of more established academics who are interested in working in this area. I think that the next thing is producing scholarly editions of these works. We need to make them available to our students. Um, and 
you know, we, we need teaching editions, we need accessible um, versions of these texts so that we, you know, we can ethically assign them. So, you know, right now, I, I can't assign a lot of the works that I want to because um, I can't ask my students to, to read them in the formats that we have or acquire them in the formats that we have. So teaching editions. Would be great, yes. Yeah. Tanya, yes? Well, one more question. Tina. Yes, of course. Sure. Um, who would you consider now, like in 20, like starting to, you know, in the early 2020 or 2021 or as a um, prominent Irish um, Gothic writer? A scholar, Irish Gothic scholar. Yeah, I mean, where, are, are there any at this point? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Charlotte Killeen um, in Trinity is, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'll probably laugh if he hears me calling this, but like, he's basically the father <laughs> of Irish Gothic studies. Um, and Bill McCormick, um, who does a lot of work on, on Lefanu and who um, also did the... Um, Section edited the section on Irish Gothic and after in the Field Day um, um, Field Day anthology. Um, other important names: Siobhan Kilfeather, um, who sadly has passed away, but her work is absolutely essential, um, uh, particularly when it comes to female Gothic. Um, and um, Luke Gibbons, for instance. Um, yeah, so there are there are a good few people working in this area. Daryl Jones um, occasionally works in Irish Gothic as well. Um, you know, so there are a good few people working in this area, and um, uh, yeah, but obviously, <laughs> obviously, we're you know I'm plotting world domination, and I want more people to join join the echelons of Irish Gothic studies. But no. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? No more questions, okay. So thank you very much uh, again, Tina, for this amazing and, and, and most interesting uh, seminar. I think we have all enjoyed it a lot and we have learned so, so at least I have learned so many things. Thank you again to, to, to Rania for inviting us to this and for organizing this, this seminars. Thank you to the British University in Egypt and thank you to the Research Center for for Irish studies. And I think we are all looking forward to uh, attending the next seminars, the incoming seminars, yes? Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I just say, take a moment to say, um, thank you very much, Christina Moran, for making the time and for being flexible and for um, understanding and um, for sharing your knowledge. Um, Maria, um, thank you very much for moderating this seminar. Um, and for our guest um, guests this, attendees this this evening, Professor Aida Raghib from Ayn Shams University here in Cairo, Egypt, oh, and um, and Dr. Um, Francis Carter, um, School of Archaeology, Geography, and Irish Studies at National University of Ireland, Galway. All right. Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, thank you very much um, for making the time for this evening. And thank you very much. From the Research Center uh, for Irish Studies at the British University in Egypt. Thank you, Rania, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Um,